Uh, we are absolutely fired up. We've got an awesome program here today. Um, we've got a very special guest uh, waiting to join us on this webinar. We had an awesome movie night last night as we watched the movie Thinking Grow Reach the Legacy. And our emails and text messages blew up this morning and all last night. People saying, when can we do that again? Um, you know, where can I buy the movie? When can we uh, do like have our own uh, Thinking Grow Rich movie event? And those are things that we will have to discuss with our, our other producers and the directors just to make sure that we can do something like that with some of you guys. But I do, I really appreciated all the feedback and the comments you guys all made and, and sent to us and including my staff. And so we were just overwhelmed last night as we, uh, finalize the end of our, our, our uh, Thinking Grow Rich movie. Well, this morning, those of you that are joining us for the very first time from wherever you are, I know last night we had people from all over the world, uh, in Hawaii, all over the country. And so this afternoon, we've got a lot to share with you, and I'd like to welcome Kashra Stan, and we've got uh, Sharon Lecter, who's going to be joining us here shortly. But Cash, how are you feeling this afternoon, brother? You're like all dressed up in a suit, man. I mean, I'm like all casual here and sitting at my house, and here you are dressed up in a suit like you're gone to work or something. So good afternoon, buddy. How are you? Oh, man, I'm so excited. Ready. I got my – I just don't have my tie on. I was like, all right, <laughs> just because it's Saturday. Tell me you got a pair – but you do have your pants on, right? I got my pants on, bro. I got my pants on. It's right here. <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. Have you seen that picture, John? Um, there's a picture of this uh, Persian guy who, is, who has his uh, hookah ready. And uh, I got to show you this. This is told as we're waiting for a couple of people to come on. This is how Persians do their appointments, bro. So I just wanted to make sure I have my pants on. But they got their hookah right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Persian businessmen do their readings. <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so, hey, we're ready. We're excited. Uh, man, I'm so excited, John, about what we're going to do today. This is going to be, uh, this is going to be epic. And I'm excited to turn us here and getting the whole thing started. And that was, uh, that was great, by the way, last night. The movie was awesome. It was, it was, uh, it was great. So, you ready, John? Let's get this party started. You ready? Because I'm ready. Yeah. Man. I, I kind of feel uh, I kind of feel sorry for some of the people might get here uh, a little bit later. You know, we got uh, a bunch of. It seems like a lot of there. We have a lot of people here right now on the call, uh, over 500. But uh, I, I I know that uh, we're gonna uh, reach uh, capacity here pretty soon because we only have uh, a capacity for a thousand uh, people. So uh, if you guys have somebody that needs to get on, I highly suggest they need to get on right now because uh, in a little bit, they won't have a chance to be able to get on. So, all right, jump into it. Okay, so everybody, here's, uh, here goes. Let's get this uh, started. So here's what we're gonna do today. First of all, I hope that uh, you got your notepad ready. You got some notes. You're ready to take, take, take some notes because we're gonna be doing a lot of Q&A, a lot of questions from uh, multi deca deca millionaires here. And, you know, whenever you get a chance and an opportunity to learn from Deca Millionaire, man, that is a, that is a, that's a big deal. You know, when I came to this country, uh, when I came to this country, they, um, I, I, I never had a mentor. I just, uh, I, I thought I had mentors, but really, they weren't really mentors. They were just people that were ahead of me that I was listening to, which is pretty much everybody I knew at the time when I came to the United States, they were ahead of me. I mean, I worked in a car wash. There's not that many people that were behind me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I really listened to everybody, and it wasn't until a few years later that um, I was able to find some mentors, and, and that kind of changed the game for me, and I never took it for granted. You know, whenever I found someone who was uh, successful, multi-multi-millionaire, I was already in the game, and, and, and man, uh, I, I started asking questions. I remember when I first uh, met uh, John, for the first time, I remember exactly where it was. It was in a restaurant in uh, Burbank. I don't even uh, I know if you remember this, John. That was the first time we met and everybody else was having uh, dinner and they're talking to each other. And there was, this was kind of like a, a treat, that kind of like a contest that you get a chance to have 
uh, dinner with the great John Shin. And everybody's like eating lunch and eating dinner. And I have my notepad ready. And I was like, boom, 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 boom. I don't know if you remember that, John. I was just going after it while asking questions from you and, and kind of picking your brain to see how you think and uh, how you build this very, very successful businesses. I shouldn't have business. Businesses, you know, so you have so many different businesses. So uh, I'm ready to, uh, so I just wanted to tell this to everybody so they have their notepad ready and they're ready to take some notes. So, because there's gonna be a lot of knowledge that's gonna drop right here. So first, so today, you guys, our topic today is financial literacy and uh, entrepreneurship. These are the two things we're gonna be talking today. We're going to talk about financial literacy and we're going to talk about entrepreneurship. And as you guys know, right now, there's no better topic that we can talk about but, but this because there's a massive disease right now that's happening in our country, a pandemic as they call it, a massive big pandemic that's happening right now. And, and it's not what you think. It's not the coronavirus. It's actually the financial virus that uh, has been eating away from the fabric of the families of the the people in this country for years and now more than ever that is becoming apparent uh, and that's why people uh, cannot uh, stay home for two uh, months without getting paid and that's why the government has to send these checks these 1200 checks and business after business after business are going under and um, people are right now in lines I don't know if you guys how many guys seen those videos are in food lines they're trying to collect food and it's just, it's kind of like, kind of sad to see this. And we've been talking about this, but we want to kind of get into it today. We want to dig deep and educate people on this. And also at the same time that we educate them, like what's the solution? What do they got to do? So now that being said, John, there's a lot of, there might be some people here that don't know your background. So I wanted to kind of start with that. Um, I don't know if you have any pictures that we can share with us or anything like that. Uh, if you do, that would be freaking awesome. But I would love to start first. I want to, and here's what we're going to do today, you guys. I'm going to go over some, I'm going to ask some questions from John. And, um, and, then at the, and then right after that, I'm going to be asking some questions from Sharon. And then we're going to have a conclusions and then some Q&A as you guys put your questions there. We'll, we'll look at those as well. Okay. So, well, first we're going to start with you, uh, John. So, you know, I don't know if you can spend a little bit of time with us and kind of tell your story, you know, how you are. Uh, how you grew up, where you grew up, your background, your upbringing, how'd you end up being in this country? And uh, let's talk about that. We'll talk about your business a little bit later, your businesses. You're, uh, you're muted, I can't hear you. Yep, there we go. All okay, right, so go. here's the thing. Uh, our parents, my parents, when I say our, my sister and I, it's just the two of us. Our parents uh, immigrated to this country from South Korea. And, you know, traditional Asian parents want their kids to become doctors and lawyers. And it's, it's very difficult in the Asian culture to talk back to your parents, right? I mean, whatever your parents tell you to do, that's what you got to do. It's not like today I see a lot of, you know, this generation, I, I would say the younger generation, you know, they have the I know syndrome or they don't want to listen to their parents or they're not as obedient. And, you know, when we were growing up, I mean, I guess I could have told my parents, you know, hey, this is my life. Don't tell me what to do. And I guess I could have said that to my parents, but I would have probably got a whipping with a bamboo stick right around my back, back of my calf. And so I learned on pretty quickly that you don't talk back to your parents uh, when they're talking to you and, and be disrespectful. And so I had no choice. I went to college, right? And so I went to college, even though I hated school, I didn't uh, really enjoy it that much, but I did it because I had no choice. But once I got into school, I mean, I, I did the best I could. And so I did go to law school. My sister became a... Um, a doctor, but my parents weren't very specific as to what kind of a doctor. So my sister ended up becoming a PhD, but she's got a double PhD and two masters, in fact. And now she's the first Asian, the first uh, woman to ever become a dean uh, at Pepperdine University, which is a very you know prestigious university here in the West Coast, which is pretty cool. But I but I went to law school, and then I ended up working in the DA's office for a bit. And uh, I hated what I was doing. And every time I'd sit there and talk to some of these people who were prosecuting, you would always ask, well, why? Like, why would you do this? What was the purpose? And, 
you know, most of the time, believe it or not, the unit that I was assigned to, <clears throat> most of these people were saying it's because they didn't have any money, right? It wasn't that because they wanted to become criminals and they wanted to do the things that they did. They did it for survival because they had no money and they didn't understand how money worked. And so uh, my, uh, Arlene, my wife, also worked in family law, and we both worked with similar government agencies, child custody and, and family issues. And every time we'd ask, you know, why these, these family disputes would happen, uh, she also said it, it all related to money and finance. So that's what triggered Arlene to become uh, going into the financial service industry in 1994. And then in 1995, a year later, after we, by the way, I met her in the same year she started her financial service business was the same year that we met. And 90 days later, I uh, basically proposed to her. So, you know, people said, oh my God, you know, when you, you know, when you know, you know, you just know it's like, it's a feeling it's indescribable. You don't, you know, it's hard to explain. Uh, I, dated you know people for you know two three four years and never had the same feeling as I when I met Arlene uh, I just knew so 90 days I proposed and of course what did everybody say are you sure about this you barely know her you know it's not gonna work out and it's amazing how many people have um, you know and maybe a lot of those people were saying things because they did care and they were concerned but you know not, I would say almost no one was supportive in the very beginning uh, but we got married you know and here we are celebrating our 26th anniversary uh, this year so pretty pretty amazing that 26 years later I mean I love her more today and I'm still in love right some people say do you love and I say yeah I love her like there's no tomorrow and uh, I'm still in love with her but besides that um, yeah I mean here you know we got in the financial service business and I got into it love what we were doing and educating people about money and finance and you know it's interesting today as you mentioned earlier cash is that you know, the government, you know, is sending money out. Like it's, it's like we're giving money to the American people. And I, and I understand, you know, that they're trying to, you know, help, but it's a bandaid. That's all it really is. Right. I mean, they're putting a bandaid on a, a while they're hemorrhaging, which really isn't going to be uh, financially they're hemorrhaging. Right. Uh, look at all the businesses, as you just alluded to, they're dri driving down the streets today and look at all the stores that are uh, closed. I mean, they're like permanently closed. Like they're not closed because of the pandemic pandemic they're officially now closed they're out of business and so you know and this is a, a huge concern because most people who become entrepreneurs or solopreneurs business owners brick and mortar you know they, they they make money but they spend i mean more than they make and that is it that is an issue itself that's that's an epidemic right is that we're, we're a culture that doesn't understand how to save money and so uh, I've, I, you know, part of the Asian culture, you know, parents are very, very strong and very disciplined to, to um, very disciplined to save money. So I learned at the early part of my age to save money. Like, I mean, save, 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 you know? And I think today, one of the biggest issues our culture faces is, and the younger generation is this thing called discipline. Right. We lack discipline. And I, and I shouldn't just discriminate and say it's the younger generation. I mean, let's face it. It's almost every generation. It's a it's a part of part of human nature is that we lack discipline. I mean, think about all of us sitting at our houses right now. Do we have the discipline as to what we're eating? Right. Uh, do we have the discipline to um, to know that right now maybe we should be doing something different with our lives? Uh, there's a great quote. I want to see if I can bring it up here. Um, a friend of mine named Victor Wong shared it with me, and I absolutely loved it. Let me see if I can bring it up here on my screen, um, because I think the slide itself actually does uh, uh, more than me just saying it. But um, here it is. Let me just uh, see if I can share my PowerPoint part here. Um, there we go. Share screen. Here it is. This is what it says. It says, if you don't come out of this quarantine, a new skill, a new side hustle, a new knowledge, uh, you never lack time, but basically you lack discipline. And, and I absolutely love this because people lack discipline today, you know, and because of this discipline in terms of saving money, uh, we are where we are. We are a nation that is in, in tremendous lack of cash. You know, people are asset rich, but cash poor. Right. This is why, you know, we've got all we have two trillion dollars in, in stimulus money. Right. And so and that's not the end of it. I get a feeling we're going to have more money. And so this concerns me as to, 
you know, we put this bandage on, we're bailing out all these companies and big corporations, but the question really is, is what kind of an impact is that going to do to the American currency? What is that going to do to the value of our dollar, right? And so, uh, which is another whole conversation, but anyway, just a little bit about me and my thought. I really wanted to ask you about that, John, because I want everybody to know. So here's the thing. So I, I, I personally know a lot of people and, and uh, met a lot of people, but I can say with confidence that John is the most knowledgeable man I've ever met in my entire life when it comes to the concept of money and finances. So that John knows crazy stuff that when we sit down, we've had many appointments uh, sometimes um, with people that are extremely wealthy. I mean, they're worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, John, I've seen John explain a couple of concepts to them and they're like, whoa, what did you just talk about? I mean, I'm talking about just from real estate to you, you name any kind of financial area. Um, and, and this guy right here, I mean, with, your, uh, with his law background and his financial background, this guy is literally the most knowledgeable. I want everybody to understand this, who's talking to this, because I want to ask you a question, John. And not only yeah. is he extremely knowledgeable, because we know a lot of people who are knowledgeable, but they're also broke. But not, not, not only John is knowledgeable, but he's a DECA millionaire, extremely successful, executive producer of Think and Grow Rich, uh, The Legacy, uh, which is this book has been one of the best selling books of all time. Uh, one of the top five best books selling of all time. This is how crazy it's like. Hey, number one is Harry Potter, right, John? And then, then you got Think and Grow Rich is one of those uh, top ones. And uh, so this is who's speaking here right now to you. And not only that, he has multiple businesses, but more than that, I got to tell you about his family life. You know, I've seen him and his wife and, uh, you know, I go to John's house and then all of a sudden I see John sitting behind the piano and he's playing the piano and he's singing love, love song to Arlene. I'm like, what, what just happened? I didn't even know you sing, John. And, and then all the four kids come along and, and I'm like, man, I, I love to have a family like that where I get to, uh, after being married, I don't know how long you've been married now, many years, and uh, to be able to sing love song for my wife and have the kids come over, and it's just awesome to see that. And his kids, I remember meeting his kids, they're like 13 years old, 14 years old, and they got their, uh, they got their portfolio on their phones, and they know exactly how to re read PE ratios, and uh, what's the beta of an investment, and I'm like, what? Like, how do, like, you're 13 years old, how do you know this stuff? And they got a great portfolio and they're making more money than some adults do. I'm not talking about John. I'm talking about John's kids. And it's just awesome how he's translated this financial information to his kid, the way he leads his family. It's just awesome. I wanted to kind of say that or everybody's listening to this. But let's talk about this uh, stimulus package. So when they're uh, giving this money, this $1,200, where is that money coming from, John? How is that going to affect American people? Where is that money coming from? Well, I mean, the government right now, I mean, that's a great question. A lot of it is going to come off of their tax returns where, you, you know, you get some tax-free deductions, and there are some limitations based on your income. Um, for some people who make a lot of money, they don't get those benefits. Well, that, that's discrimination in itself, right? Because a guy like me, I don't get that write-off, right? If I have children that are dependent on me, I don't get that write-off. So it's interesting that when you make too much money, you don't get that benefit. And we'd say, hey, there's no discrimination. But there, let's face it, there is discrimination. But, you know, a lot of this money is where government is sending money to the American families. And they're not really telling them what to do with that money either. Right. Well, so what are they going to do? From, John? Where is that money coming from? Like, are they printing money? Where's that money coming from? Like, how does the government? Well, yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. They're going to be printing more money. They don't have that money, right? They don't have, the government doesn't have money. We're, we're a nation in debt too. I mean, if you sat there and actually looked at how much money we owe around the world to different countries, we're in debt. You know, I mean, we're, we're trillions and trillions of dollars in debt. And so, um, and we can't sustain this debt uh, that this country is facing for another, you know, how many more years can we go? I mean, it, we're, we're hemorrhaging. You know, and, and yet we're not printing more money and we're, we're creating more, more money, you know, um, to, to go into the system. And how does that printing money, uh, what, what effect that has uh, on the value of dollar? Well, the more money we print, the less the, the, the value of the dollar goes down. Right. So our money, uh, the value of our dollar goes down. And so, 
you know, th- this is a huge concern as to, you know, the value of the American currency. I mean, fortunate, you know, it was interesting a few years ago, I actually went to Europe and, um, you know, I was traveling around. In fact, I think you were with me actually, Cash. And, you know, I went to a, I went to a, a bank, or not a bank, you know, like an exchange thing, and I gave them $100, a Ben Franklin, American U.S. $100. Thought I was awesome, man, because I had a $100 bill. I gave them 100 bucks, and guess what? They gave me back $70 back. And I was like, I mean, 70 euros. And I was like, wait a second, I gave you 100 And they're like, yeah, this is it's the currency value exchange. And I'm like, what? Since when was the U.S. dollar less than the, uh, than the euros. And I was getting $70 back. Now today it's a little bit different. Our value is a little bit higher, but still, I mean, now where's our dollar going to go? You know, the purchasing power and the strength of the American dollar. So, uh, you know, it concerns me. I mean, I don't know what the, uh, the effects are going to be as we print more, as we we're you know, we've got 2.2 trillion. And then of course, you know, if you're watching the news and they're talking about all these, you know, they're talking about another three or $4 million in, in stimulus package. Holy smoke, that's the biggest, that's the most we've ever had to, uh, to create in terms of a stimulus package. And, and that's crazy, just so everybody understand, anytime the government prints money, it creates inflation. What that means is your money is losing its value. So, um, so if you've seen someone, if, if, in other words, if they have $100,000 sitting in their bank account, next year, now they have 97, even though it's 100,000, but if it didn't gain that value, at least 3%, so the loss is value at 3%, at least, you know. So that's one thing we were talking about. So that's the effect. Now, let's talk yeah, about, John. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Can, let me tell you, that, as you just alluded to, putting money in the bank. You know, I think putting money in the bank is probably the most guaranteed way to go broke, right? Because let, let, let's just take a look at this real fast. Let's say, let's say you had $10,000, not even $100,000, and you, and you if you put your money in a bank, and the bank gave you 3% interest, that 3% interest um, would be equivalent to how much? I mean, what is 3% of $10,000? That's $300, right? So you made $300. So most people are like, oh my God, look, I just made $300. But wait a second, the, the inflation, as you just referred to, the, you know, the purchasing power is, is on average about 3%. So that means that the purchasing power of $10,000 dropped by what? $300. So if you made $300, but you, le- you lost $300, you basically broke even. So you made no money. You made zero money. But so people say, well, at least I got, you know, at least I have my principal and I've got no money. It's, I mean, I didn't make any money. That's fine. I didn't lose money. And I go, no, but in fact you did. And they say, well, how is that? And so the two greatest enemies to our money, one is what inflation and number two is taxes. So now the $300 that you just made, you're going to have to pay a, a, a ordinary income tax on that you know, federal and state. And so let's just say you paid 30% or 20%. Let's just say it was 30%. What's 30% of $300? $90. You just lost 90 bucks to go stick your money in a bank. That's why I don't believe in putting my money in the bank. I mean, I might go in there just to cash a check or something, but me leaving, you know, millions of dollars in a bank is not going to happen. I'm going to have my money invested somewhere and giving me passive income. It's not residual. That's different, which I did a talk a couple weeks ago in terms of the difference between uh, um, residual income and passive income, but I want passive income, right? Is what um, Sharon Lecter will probably talk about momentarily. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and you know, uh, we talked about, hey, inflation, m- your money is losing value. And some people are like, well, inflation is, first of all, you need to be educated on this stuff. That's number one. And some people are like, well, inflation is not 3%. It's like one point some percent or 2%, which is crazy to think about because a lot of people here doesn't know that there's two inflation factors. So the inflation factor where everybody sees where the government actually releases, what they do, they take uh, energy and food out of it. In other words, if gas prices goes up or food prices goes up, that doesn't even reflect on inflation. So how crazy is that, by the way? It's, it's crazy. I want you guys to know this is, I don't know if John wants to say anything on that. So don't you see those, those numbers, those inflation numbers that you see? Those are not real numbers. There's nobody who's gone to grocery shopping lately uh, or put gas in their car that does that know the gas price has gone up a lot more than 3%. The food price has gone up a lot more than 3%. When I came to US in 1999, gas were 99 cents. Today is like four bucks something, so it's crazy. All right, John, so uh, let's get into it. Um, so we talked about how crazy uh, the situation is. Uh, government's printing money. 
um, and uh, there's a massive lack of education. So I wanted to ask, I'm going to ask this from Sharon as well. So why do you think there's this massive lack of education? I don't know if there's any more stats you want to give us on financial stuff, but why is this, you know, why are we such a bad shape, number one? And um, yeah, let's talk about that. Why are we such a bad shape? And um, you're, you're getting there, I guess. And uh, why are we teaching, why are we not teaching this stuff in schools? Why is this stuff not being taught schools? Well, I think that, that's, a, that's a serious problem. I mean, here's, here's the thing. In fact, let me see if I can switch this out and, and jump down here to a different slide just so you can see um, what I'm referring to. Uh, let me see if I can just jump down here for a second. Okay, so get this. So can, can, you, can you see this here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in, 2000, in 2012, in our union, 37 states required sex education. That was in 2012. Okay, so these four states right here that are lit up in blue are the only four states that require financial literacy in our country today. And so l let me just talk about, let me just discuss with you the, the progress in terms of financial literacy, where we're going. You'll see that in 2015, we added one state. So now we only have five states, and this is, this is like 2015. This is only five years ago. This isn't like 1850, right? I mean, we're talking about five states in our union that mandate financial literacy courses in our school system, at least teaching it in one semester. Uh, this is quite different than if we look at, you know, other countries today, what, what they're teaching their children in, in their academic system, that, that these kids are learning about money uh, early are and, er, earlier on in their elementary days, right? They're learning calculus. Um, a lot of these other countries are learning calculus now uh, in seventh and eighth grade. And we're, we're learning calculus. Our ki our, the, the United States children are learning calculus or may even never take calculus in, uh, in, in college. Okay, so you can see the acceleration in their learning about money and finance and just, you know, um, financial literacy. And so just to give you an idea, this came out from the Center for Financial Literacy at Chaplin College. And you can see the grade that these countries all received in terms of the highest ranks in their efforts to improve financial literacy in high schools. You can see where the California stands right here. We're red, right? So we're in a whole lot of trouble. So now, you know, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't teach funny, uh, excuse me, sex education. All I'm saying is that we should teach sex education and understand so these children understand STD, STD and child pregnancy and all that kind of stuff. But if our children are mature enough to understand sex, then, then our school system should teach our children about money and finance and how it works. And so going back over here, um, I want to just go back up here and show you one of my other slides. Uh, let's see here. Where did it go? Um, I had a whole presentation set up, but um, let me just, uh, here it is. So these are the six steps to financial security. Cash. In fact, I think everyone here needs to understand how to increase their cash flow, right? Um, minimize their expenses. In fact, that's something that people should be doing right now, right? Looking at their, in, their inbound cash flow and what are they spending going out? Like what can they be doing to minimize their expenses? And uh, I actually did a thing with you, I think, or two weeks ago or a week ago on how to minimize their expenses. But people need to be very proactive in terms of reducing their expenses right now, managing their debt, get, creating an emergency fund, having proper protection, protecting their family. Uh, God forbid if you got the COVID-19 disease and we don't know how it's going to affect you and what the outcome is going to be. But I, I always, you know, pray for the best. But if it doesn't, is your does your family have enough money to to uh, have you do you have insurance like life insurance you know to protect your family? Do you have disability insurance? Do you have long term care insurance? Right? These are all things people are like. Oh, I didn't know, and they only know and they start to realize this when it's too late. Right? When someone's dead or dying, that's when they go. Oh, I should buy life insurance. Right? Or oh, I'm going to go get disability now that I'm disabled. Right? And it's 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 kind of like a it's like a Murphy's law. Right? It's like when do people break into, you know, you only get an alarm system for your house after you've been violated, right? Someone came in and broke into your house and walked around and went through your drawers. Suddenly you feel violated. 
and now you want to go get an alarm system. Like you couldn't get an alarm system before, right? And so you don't decide to take self-defense courses until after you got your butt kicked inside out. Then you want to take self-defense classes, right? Now you want to go get maize or pepper spray or whatever else it is, or go buy yourself a, a gun or whatever. I don't know. But the bottom line is people need to start preparing for these kinds of things. And I, and I, and listen, let me, I, I, cause it's so important cash. Um, Let's talk about some of the things that they can be doing here. Um, I did, uh, let me just go through this real fast because everybody that's listening, I want you to be very proactive, right? Um, let's see here. There's almost 600 people on this call now. So uh, look, let's look at, look at your spending on non-essential food shopping. Let's reduce some of that. That should save you $300 a month, right? Um, and then uh, subscriptions, right? Your monthly subscriptions. Some of you guys are like getting deliveries right now. I mean, we're, in a, we're experiencing a pandemic right now. You should be re looking at your expenses and saying, do I really need that subscription box? Do I really need Sirius XM, right? Or iHeartRadio. I, I mean, that's money every single month that uh, is going out. 75 bucks. Gym memberships. You're not going to the gym right now. Go work out in your own house. Uh, Netflix, Hulu, cable TV. Uh, are those things that are really necessary? I mean, the younger generation says, yeah, I need my Disney Channel. I need my Netflix or Hulu. But then get rid of cable, right? Um, you know, I've got uh, properties in, in other states. And, you know, Arlene said to me, I said, hey, is there anything? Because I'm, like, telling the world that we should be cutting expenses. And Arlene goes, man, we got expenses, too. We should look at it. And we just sat down, and we were talking about our cable bill in, our, in a, one, of our other, one of our houses in Vegas. And, and, and she pulled out our, our, our cable bill there, and it's $600 a month, Whoa. right, Cash? Yeah, because I got two, because I got a house in the front, I got a house in the back, they both got internet, uh, they both got cable, we got like 12 boxes on our property, they're all DVR, we got every movie channel you can imagine, we got the gold package, and you know, we got a thousand channels that we don't even watch, and so I'm like, oh my God, so we called them, we called up the cable company, and we said, hey, we'd like to cancel our cable subscription, and we saved ourselves $600, man. Right. I mean, that's just one of our properties. Right. I mean, can we, we started to do that for multiple properties. Thanks again. No, I got thousands of dollars. That, that's just me. I don't even know what other people are doing. Right. Online retail therapy, man, people are blowing money. They're like online shopping at Amazon, like stuff they don't need. Right. They're still shopping at Bed Bath and Beyond right now. Uh, joy rides, you know, they want to go for a drive and go where, what if you got in an accident while you're going on your joy ride and now you end up in the hospital and you didn't have COVID-19 and now you do, right. Cause you end up in the hospital, right. Right? It's like the worst place to be. Yard work, gardening, pool man, get rid of those people. It's 250 bucks. Gifts. All events are canceled. That money that you would have spent on gifts, man, go and save that money. Go stick that money in an IRA or something, right? Some sort of an IUL. Um, Starbucks, make your own coffee. That's 150 bucks, right? Child care, that's $1,200 or even more for some people. Uh, let's take a look at entertainment. They're, everything is closed. You could be saving that money. That's $200. I mean, I just added that up right there, cash. That's almost $3,200 a month in savings, right? I mean, I, I saved almost $3,000 a month in just cutting all my cable on my properties right now, right? I mean, I'm not going to go anywhere these places, so we cut all our cable out. And, 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 and people are like, John, well, what about my student loans? Well, part of the CARES Act right now permits uh, people with federal student loans to defer those all the way to the end of September at 0% interest, right? I mean, that's something to celebrate, right? I mean, you know, you, you got to celebrate everything. I'm pretty excited about that for the people, right? I mean, that you could actually forbear those, right? Like defer those. Uh, mortgage payments. Some people, they're like, oh, my God, I can't make their mortgage payment. I can't make my mortgage payment. John, can I give you a loan? Can you give me a loan, John? People are calling me to get loans right now, Cash. I mean, it's, I'm not, it's not the bank of shin. I'm not a bank, right? And so um, I'm not in that business. But here's the thing is that uh, you can call up your mortgage company, and you can suspend your mortgage payments up to 12 months without having it ding your credit report, right? And so um, uh, what else can you do? Um, That's a big deal. I don't know, don't know that. A lot of people don't yeah, know. Yeah, you, do right you got to be proactive. Like you can't just ignore your financial, you know, your fiscal responsibilities right now, right? You need to be proactive and call the banks and say, hey, bank, can you, listen, I, 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 you know, we're going through some tough times right now. Can we defer, you know, and they'll do that. You know, not all banks, but most banks will. Car loans, same thing. You can suspend your car payments for up to like six months right now, right? And so... Credit cards, right? You can ask for help there. You can call your credit card issuer and say, can you help me out here? You know, just like 90 days, four months, five months. They'll work with you on these kind of things without dinging your credit report. But you got to work. You got to be proactive. Utilities. Same thing here. 
So again, you can call your local gas company, your water, your power, your, your garbage, and uh, just, hey, listen, I'm, we're going through some tough times. You know, we can't go to work. We've been on furloughed. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of savings. Can you work with us for 90 days? So these are all things that people don't understand right now. And of course, you know, two and a half weeks ago when I knew about the CARES Act offering a $10,000 grant, you know, to all these different business owners, I mean, like every day, three times a day, Cash, I was doing a webinar getting people to do the CARES thing or to go and get that $10,000 grant. And then guess what? They waited till the last minute because it was a first come, first serve basis. And now they're calling me, you know, over the weekend and say, John, I just saw something on the news that the government's already ran out of that money. So I can't get that money. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? Why did you wait till now to do it when I've been telling you two weeks ago? Right? So people need to move at the speed of instruction, right? When we tell somebody to do something, we, you got to do it. Right? I mean, you got to use some common sense here and, uh, and just start pulling the trigger and moving forward. Right? And so awesome. this is what I'm talking about. So it goes back to the six steps, Cash. Awesome. Awesome. So I wanted to, uh, so, we, you know, everybody, we're talking about the idea of not just saving money, because we just talked about if you save your money and put it in a bank, you just lost money. So, but we yeah. were talking about actually investing that money, being protect, uh, proactive uh, and reducing some of the expenses and, and having the right mentality. I tell you what, you know, when I, uh, I'm Persian, so Persians drive nice cars. And I remember when I had my first job, I was making 65 grand a year. And, uh, all my friends have nice cars. So I went and I bought this Audi A6 fully loaded, uh, $55,000 car. And, uh, and I thought it was awesome because everybody I knew was doing the same thing. And that was kind of the norm. You know, we, we live here in Newport Beach and uh, Orange County. Orange County is like that. But then you add being Persian on top of it, it's crazy. So, and, and I, it wasn't until I met my first mentor and he said, hey, how much money are you paying for your car? And I, he took my car payment, John, and he showed me if I would have invested that car payment, in 30 years, that would have been about 1.5 million. And it really opened my eyes when he told me that I could do that. So it's not just saving money we're talking about, we're talking about investing. And we're talking about the habit of it. It's so much more important for somebody to have a habit of investing than actually be investing. See, a lot of people don't understand this. What's the hardest part of going to the gym? Going to the gym, that's the hardest part. Starting something. And I started, John, I started saving a few hundred bucks a month, 500 bucks a month. Then it became a thousand bucks a month. And then as our business grew, then it became 10,000, 20, 30, 40,000 a month in just into investments because as we, as I learned about entrepreneurship and making more money, but if I never created that habit before, there's a lot of people who make a lot of money, but they spend it all. So yep. and that's, I think that's the, that's the problem with uh, in the, in the country. And we're seeing it right now. I always used to say, if I was uh if I was becoming a president, I could solve all the financial problems. Now, I can't be the president because I, 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 was, I was not born here. But if I was, I have a solution, John, and I want to see what you think about it. So my solution would be this. I would have everybody wear a name badge, okay? It's a martial law. You want to get out of your house, you got to wear a name badge. Everybody got to wear a name badge. Now, on the name badge, it says your net worth and how much money you got saved. I think if everybody were a name match with their net worth, man, it's, I think the saving problems would be solved because all we care about is what other people think about us when it comes to it. That's why everybody drives the nice car and this and that and that. And, and I tell you, man, when I started not caring about what other people think of me and I started putting that money aside, you know, we believe if you impress anybody with, with anything beside your character and how much money you invest and you save, you're going down the wrong road 100 miles an hour. So once I start, started doing that, man, that changed. And I, I wanted to talk about this as we're having this conversation because I want people to think about that. So, John, as we talked about, you know, yes, cut, cut some of the expenses, understanding what's happening with the mortgages and the loans. Now I want to get into basic fundamental. Can you give like three basic fundamentals of building wealth and why around these times is the best times to invest money? There are more people became billionaire during Great Depression than any other time. So maybe, I don't know if you can share a couple of things, a couple of basics. And uh, I know that uh, this topic we're talking about is not really a, sometimes a sexy topic. Uh, everybody likes to talk about, okay, what are the greatest, how can I make get rich quick? You know, everybody wants to do. And I think that's one of the problems that we have. Everybody wants to get rich quick versus understanding you can actually become very wealthy, but it's going to take a little bit of time. So 
Is there yeah. some principles you can share right there before we get into the next topic? With everybody. Well, I mean, there's a couple things. Yeah, I mean, here, let me just show you this. Pre talk, about uh, taxes. This talk about how big the taxes yeah. are, maybe a couple of things like that. Yeah, let me, let me um, show you something here real quick. Where did it go? Yeah. All right. All right, here we go. Check this out. We as Americans have been told to put money in these things called 401k plans, IRAs, and what have you. And, you know, now Time Magazine says why it's time to retire the 401k. Basically meaning get rid of it. It's not as good as everybody thinks it is. One of the reasons why it's not so good or as good in some way with people that don't have discipline is that you, you really can't touch your money until you're 59 and a half years of age, right? Prior to 59 and a half, if you were to take money out of these accounts, there is a 10% penalty tax. Um, and then, of course, if you live in California and other states, there is another uh, penalty of 2.5. So you're paying almost 12 and a half percent in penalty taxes just to get this money out. Well, part of the CARES Act right now allows you to the end of the year to access up to $100,000, okay, up to $100,000 out of these accounts. So one of the things is if your money is sitting in a 401k plan at your work, there's a lot of volatility to that principle, right? So there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees of your principal. There's no guarantees of uh, uh, an annual return on your money. It, it's fluctuating. You're really dependent on whatever the market performance is. And right now, we don't know what the market performance is. Some people say we already hit the rock bottom, but we don't know that. Nobody knows that. I mean, people are saying all sorts of stuff, right? I mean, people were saying for the last seven years that the market was going to crash, and it hasn't crashed in the last seven years, right? And the market really didn't crash now, it, it, because, you know, because of the economy. It, it crashed because, it, you know, and it's not that it's crashing, it's, right? It's, it's uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a little, you know, little turbulence in the market, but that's because of the coronavirus. So let me just tell you that you can actually take your money out of these plans up to $100,000 without having to pay any taxes. Okay. And then, so what people say, well, where would I put that money? Well, where you can put that money right now is something called an index annuity. And so here, this is a very important thing here, um, Cash, because I, I'm about to write a book, right? Um, and uh, this book is a book <clears throat> on how I had my best years doing, during a recession. So, what, I mean, I, I've been in this industry since 1995. I've had multiple recessions uh, since 1995 that I've personally experienced. And every, every time we've had a, um, an economic, you know, downturn or a recession, I actually, I had my best years uh, ever. In fact, uh, this month, in the month of March, was one of my best months I've ever had. And I'll tell you why. And in April as well, this month will be one of my best months. And so I've now, I can actually write this book based on my experience and how I'm in a recession-proof business. And so how am I in a recession-proof business today? Well, number one is this. There are several different companies here, uh, companies like Nationwide, Transamerica, Global Atlantic, Athene, um, you know, and Athene's got a couple of products, but basically the, the minimum investment is $10,000, right? And so you put in $10,000 and here's what they're going to do. A lot of people are upside down 20% in their brokerage accounts or their retirement accounts. Can you imagine taking that money right now and putting in one of these companies and getting a 20% sign-in bonus right now? Uh, you're getting a 20% sign-in bonus day one, okay? And like this product right here, you can take out your money after 30 days. And what's great about this is it offers you a 10% simple interest guarantee on the principal that you actually put in. And so these are for us right now selling like hotcakes. I mean, I know you're working as hard as I am, but I'm literally working like 18, 20 hour days right now. And there, I don't even know if my days are ending, right? I'm literally like taking naps in between three, four hour naps. Uh, and so it's just like, it just never ends. Right. And so this is a tremendous business 
for me, and this is why I'm selling these like hotcakes, because a lot of people are calling and say, John, what should I do with my money? Where should I put my money? Well, this is a great place to put your money, because number one, you put your money here, your principal's guaranteed, you got um, still the whole tax deferred growth, there's no fees, no penalties, no cost to move your money over. The government also says you could take money from your 401k and your IRA and take money out of those, even if you're still working there and move it into one of these accounts. Are you kidding me? This is like, this is like, this is like awesome, man. And so people are putting money into these accounts like crazy. So, and, and then of course, you know, let me tell you from a standpoint, um, uh, let me just go back here real fast. You know what's cool about this yeah. is that uh, there's some good money to be made here. Like people are like suffering to make money. Well, if they went and just got a license for a couple hundred dollars with the state that they live in, and uh, I think California is like 188 bucks, right? It's a hundred dollar background check, $88 to go and take the exam right now. Like literally you can be licensed in the next two days. Cash, get this. On an average account of $100,000, let's say we make 5%, some companies pay out 6%, we make five grand, and you make on average like 50%, somewhere between 30 and 70%, so I use 50% as an average, you make $2,500. I mean, would there be some people who like to make $2,500? Multiply that by four clients, like one a week, sitting at home, you're self-confined, quarantined, what, what else are you going to do with your time? Right? Remember that slide I shared with you earlier? I mean, you need to have some discipline right now. At $2,500 a week, you're making ten grand. Suddenly now you got some money to go buy some bread. Right? You got, you got some money to go and put some groceries right? A little, little, and, and some savings here. So this is why I love the business I'm in and the industry that I'm in cash. And I think for people who want to make extra money, it's a tremendous opportunity. That's awesome. So I want to ask a couple of questions because, first of all, why are they paying those uh, – percentages why are they paying is why are they paying 20 percent bonus for somebody to go in there right now well it's a sign-in bonus they're incentivizing people to get back into the market right some people have taken their money and just went to cash and they're just sitting on the sidelines like just you know paranoid that they don't know when the market's gonna you know bottom out mm -hmm. And so, they, so to bring consumer confidence back in, right, and say, hey, it's okay. These big fat insurance companies, A-rated company insurance companies, are saying, hey, you know, we have faith in the, the American system. We have faith in the economy. Well, in fact, if you take your money and bring it over to us, we'll give you 20% as a sign-in bonus, right, to incentivize you to get your money and get back into the market. Mm, okay. Good. 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 Now, it's interesting because you mentioned annuities, and uh, annuities is kind of like. I feel like annuities is a bad word sometimes because it's annuities kind of like saying fruits. One is like an orange and then one is a, one is a banana. Both of them are fruits, but they're completely different. Yep. And uh, uh, what's interesting is, you know, sometimes people are like, well, annuities have a lot of high fees. And as we know, index annuities actually have no fees. These products It's actually cheaper than a 401k, a lot cheaper than a 401k. So this education, what I love about this whole thing, like, so, it's education about money. That's why we wanted to have this call to educate. If you don't know any of this stuff that John's talking about, you got to uh, talk to somebody. We, I know we do classes on this um, about money. You know, every week, uh, every week we have a class where people can come learn about different areas of money. And I love how John's jumping into some of this stuff. But that is a big opportunity you talked about when it comes to 401s. Because also on those 401s, on that 10% penalty that they don't get, have to pay up to 100 grand, and they also, they have up to three years to pay that tax. And that's a very, that's very right. big deal. So that's um, right. again, this is a whole class. We're not trying to go into detail into this, but just for you to understand that when you take that money out, you don't have, you, so normally you have to pay taxes on the entire thing, but now you get to divide it to three different year. So your tax bracket is not gonna jump up a lot. So you get to pay a lot less taxes and you get to put it in a tax exempt account where you don't have to pay taxes on the gain of your money. So that's what I was trying to uh, get into, John, when I was asking that question, you know, how big of a deal is taxes? You know, get, making sure their money's compounding. But I think taxes is one of the biggest deals right now with what's happening with the government's printing money right now more than ever. Uh, on top of that, um, you know, uh, and maybe you can talk about this a little bit. What's interesting is one of the, uh, the biggest problem that this country has right now when it comes to money and finances you know, when social programs got created in the United States, 
uh, social security, you get your social security at 62, but the average life expectancy was 59. So people would qualify for over 62, but then they'll die at 59. So for every 50 people who put money into these program, only one person took money out. So today, because of technology and people living longer, for every one person who's taking money out of this program, there's only three people that are putting money into these programs. So why is that related to our topic? Because, so I always ask people this, hey, do you think, where, the, where, where do you think taxes are gonna go? Do you think taxes are gonna go up? I'm gonna go down. And it's crazy, 99% of people, they give an answer, but they have no clue, really, about the answer they just gave us. So, but the crazy part is, what do you think the money for these social program comes in? Social security, Medicare, the government's printing money right now. Where is that money coming from? Who's gonna pay for these programs? So you can do two things. You can either cut the programs or you can raise the revenue, which is the taxes. Now, if I was running for presidency right now and I would go out there and say, look, we need to cut the social programs. Or I would say, hey, we need to raise taxes. I would not get elected for that program. You have to understand. And it's simply a math problem. That's why I wanted to bring this awareness to everybody that if you don't understand what's happening and you're like, hey, I'm going to put my money in a 401k because later I'll be in a lower tax bracket, it just really means the person is not really educated about what's happening to, the, to our money and finances situation. So I tell people this all the time. I said, look, if I lend you $100,000 right now, John, what's the first question you should ask me? What's the interest rate? And I say, look, don't worry about the interest rate, John. Take the money. Go enjoy it. When you come back later, I'll tell you how much you have to pay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure nobody would sign up on that deal. But we have 80% of our U.S. population that's signing up on that deal every single day on their 401. They say, don't worry about paying taxes now. Later on, we'll tell you how much we tax you. And that's a very... Uh, very, very scary, uh, very, very scary situation to be in. But anyway, I need to, sh uh, we need to shift gear here. And uh, I, I want to bring Sharon up. Real, real quick, uh, yeah. real quick. Hey, Cash, I just want to share one slide here with you because I think it's pretty, it's uh, pretty awesome for people to see this because most people like right now as you're quarantined, this is what you should go look at right here. This is my personal social security statement. And uh, right here it says social security. Most people don't even know where to get it. We used to get this thing in the mail, like a green thing. This was all like color and it was green. Um, I pulled mine up just to give everybody, this was back in 2015, so five years ago. First of all, my, my payment, my monthly payment is going to be $2,105 a month. And it says at full retirement age. And by the way, for me, full retirement age is uh, age um, 66. Okay, that's what it is. And uh, look at down here what it says. Read this paragraph, right? This is straight from Social Security. It says, Social Security benefits are not intended to be your only source of income when you retire. On average, it says Social Security will replace about 40% of your annual pre-retirement earnings. You will need other savings, investments, pensions, or retirement accounts to make sure you have enough money to live comfortably when you retire. I mean, they even put it like right on the front page, right on, right there, saying, this is not going to be it. You need to look at other things. And yet people neglect, right? It says here, you will need other, they neglect this whole entire last sentence. People need to start saving money and start investing that money into appreciating assets. And it's all about assets, right? Having the assets that make money for you, right? And so I just wanted to share that with you, brother, because I think it's important for people to understand and acknowledge that. And, of course, what better person than, than somebody who uh, knows a lot about money? So why don't you take a, a moment and kind of introduce um, this incredible lady to everyone right now? All right, Sharon, uh, we, let's, have, uh, let's see if she can hear us and we can have our video on. I'm excited, you guys, for this. Uh, here she is. Hey, we're excited that you're here with us, Sharon. Thank you so much for uh, spending a little bit of time on your Saturday afternoon with us. Man, this is, um, this is pretty exciting, everybody. Let me, um, I mean, we've been talking about this and been talking about this, but I do want to... Uh, talk a little bit more about this and how big of a deal this is, okay? So you guys all heard of the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It's what, probably one of the most famous books of all time next to Thinking Grow Rich. So this lady right here, she wrote, uh, she co-authored it with Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. She was the president of Rich Dad, Poor Dad for over 10 years. She's written many different books, uh, such as Thinking Grow Rich for Women, 
Outwitting the Devil, which is one of my favorite books, by the way, Sharon, Outwitting the Devil. That, that helped me a lot during the, the, some tough times that I was going through. And, and, and on top of that, you guys, check this out. She is literally the president, like the president, the United States, from Bush to Obama, President Advisory Council for Financial Literacy, quite for literally the country of the United States. She's the president of the financial literacy of the entire United States of America we have here with us today on Zoom. So thank you, Sharon. Welcome to the call. Thank you, Cash. I'm delighted to be with you, both you and John. I love you both and miss you and happy that you're doing this and I appreciate you including me. Yes, we're, we're excited. So I wanted to, again, ask you a couple of questions. So first of all, um, I want to ask you about your journey and how you, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, having a business and having been an entrepreneur, money, financial literacy. So how does that whole thing came about? Tell us about Sharon when she was younger and, and uh, a little bit about your story. Certainly. Well, um, we lived in a very lower middle class area. My dad was retired military. Neither one of my parents had high school um, graduation certificates. So we lived in a small house between my mother's beauty shop and my father's car lot. We had um, rental properties that I had to go scrub out between tenants, go scrub the bathrooms, and I had, or we had orange groves. I swore um, I didn't, would never be an entrepreneur. In fact, I was going to be a sophisticated professional. So I got my degree. I went to college, um, got my degree in accounting, started my career in Atlanta, single woman in Atlanta. And I was working, I was one of the very first women to work with this public accounting firm. And I uh, was on the fast track to partner. And about the ripe old age of 25, my parents started looking a whole lot smarter. I said, you know, if I'm going to work these many hours, I should be working for myself, not someone else. And so at 25, I had one of my clients invite me to go in, have a piece of the rock. And I've never looked back. I've been an entrepreneur ever since. Started a woman's magazine, sold that, started the first children's talking book with the sound strips down the side, grew that industry from zero to global. Uh, our last year on 52 million in sales, we sold that. Then we relocated to Arizona and my oldest child, went off to college. And when he got there, he had the tables of free pizza, free money, free t-shirt, free money, the gauntlets of tables. And we didn't even know he had a credit card. And he came home at Christmas time and he was $2,500 in credit card debt. He'd had a really good time this first semester in college. But uh, we haven't always made the right parenting decisions, but we refused to bail him out. And it took him seven years to get a debt and to repair his credit. But he's as passionate as I am today about teaching financial literacy. But that was December of 1992. Mm -hmm. And that's when I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education and financial literacy. You fast forward a few years, my husband called me. Mike is an intellectual property attorney. And by the way, John, if you're still listening, we met in January. We were married in September, but we decided to get married like within three weeks of knowing each other. And we're celebrating 40 years of marriage this year. So, oh, oh my God. God. So I love you and Arlene, but, but just these are, we need to be good examples for everybody else that uh, marriage right. can work and it can be long-term. So, but uh, Mike called me and he had this guy that came into his office in Bermuda shorts and flip flops with this idea of a game um, on a piece, drawn off on a piece of paper under his arm. And it was Robert Kiyosaki. And it was his idea for the game um, cash flow. And I met him at the first beta test of the game. And I was the only one that got out of the rat race. I loved it because it was, the, it was sharing the principles that I was teaching. And that is to buy, build, or create assets. The word assets, my favorite word, assets are sexy. Um, I'm doing an event May 15th, assetsaresexy.com. If you want more information about it, it's a free event assets are sexy. And so I love the game. I volunteered with my background to help him commercialize the game. And in that process, he asked me to be his partner. And he told me he wanted to charge $200 for the game. So, well, maybe we should write a brochure. That's kind of pricey. It kind of talks about the philosophy. And that brochure, most people don't know that, but that brochure was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And we never thought it was going to take on a life of its own. 
Then all of a sudden we decided, okay, well, maybe we'll write a trilogy. We did Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, and Guide to Investing. And over our 10-year relationship, 10-year um, partnership as I led the company globally, we wrote 15 books together. And um, the Rich Dad brand just exploded before Amazon, before the internet. It was truly people reading it, finding value, and sharing it. So the true viral success, people telling other people. And so it was an incredible um, experience. We were, you know, we ended up in 51 languages, over 100 countries, and it was an incredible ride. And then in 2007, we'd been um, in relationship for 10 years. And I was, he wanted to go into franchising, it wasn't a model I agreed. So I made the decision to leave. I tell people, sometimes you have to close one door for other doors of opportunity to open. And that's what I always say, but now I have to revise it. Because what's happening right now, sometimes doors get closed on you. Mm. And you can't lament that. You have to make sure you say, well, what new doors can I open right now? This is the land of opportunity. So case in point, I didn't know what was ahead of me. I thought Rich Dad was my legacy. And the, you know, somebody upstairs said, oh, no, there's more for you to do. And that's when I got the call a few months later from President Bush. So I served President Bush and Obama, the President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. And a few months later, in 2008, we know what was happening in the economy back then. Um, I got the call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation now. I read Think and Grow Rich when I was 19. And so I had the you know, incredible honor to be asked to step in and help them reinvigorate the teachings of Napoleon Hill. And so, as you mentioned, I have had the honor, I wrote Three Feet from Gold, I'm Outwitting the Devil, Think and Grow Rich for Women, Now Success is Something Greater. So it's just been an incredible journey. And so, you know, the, the universe told me that my legacy is much bigger than Rich Dad Poor Dad and that I have more to do. And everybody watching and listening, you're going through this time. You know, we all have things that stop us in our track, but we're still here. You're still here for a reason. And what you've experienced, you can share and help others so that they don't have the same, you know, they can steer away around the pitfalls. That's awesome. That is so great. You know, I, I remember I went to USC and that was my financial education, opening up credit cards. That was literally, I, we would get a slice of pizza, no t-shirts though. So. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and that's what happened to my son. Now, when I was on the President's Advisory Council in 2009, we passed the Credit Card Act, which prohibits credit card companies from soliciting kids on college campus or from a, a thousand feet of college activities. So I can't really take credit for the bill but I can take credit for being a very squeaky wheel about the need for it. Yeah, and I was gonna, get, I, I wanna get in there also. So first, let's talk about this. Why, why is, fine, so this country is supposed to be the greatest country in the whole world, right? And I really believe it is. So why is it that this stuff, and you know, you never meet somebody that says, you know, my goal is not to be financially independent. My goal is to work for someone for the rest of my life. You, you never meet somebody like, yeah, I want to be financial. I want to have more time with my family. I want to have more. So this is something that everybody wants, but we don't teach about it. So what's, what's the story behind that? What's, what's the thing? Like, you, well, it's you absolutely know. criminal. You know, as I heard John earlier talk about the various number of states, I think there are now 12 states that require it embedded in other subjects and seven states that require an independent semester course. My goal, I got the laws changed in Arizona to require it as part of the like, economics, and we're still at the plate trying to get it as a separate course. But we're, we're supporting every state trying to get that done. And there's several things that, that hold us back. A lot of it is teachers' unions. They don't want any more responsibilities on teachers. Um, people are afraid to teach it because they know that they need it themselves. And it's, it, you know, we learn, we, we've heard that phrase the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Well, that's because we learn about money at home. If people were really serious about leveling the playing field so that every child has equal opportunity to succeed, we would all say, yes, let's require financial education in school because that's what they wanna know. When I'm working with high school students, they go, this is what I need to know. Why am I not learning this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then they say, my parents need this, right? But the teachers are afraid because they don't feel like they're competent to teach it. Um, the administrators feel like it's more taxing on the teachers. It just drives me nuts. Wow, but it's wow. until all of us stand up and demand it. Because as John said about sex education, we teach our kids about condoms, but we don't teach them about the dollar bill. 
that's insane. It's criminal and it's got to change. That is, that's absolutely crazy. Uh, we we're definitely, we're a big believer of that, getting this stuff into the schooling system. Right now, we're, we're doing a course. Uh, it's like a free course we're doing for everybody. Um, that, and they learn everything about budgeting to different types of insurances, retirement, Medicare, Medi-Cal, what's an annuity, 401k, IRS, and we're offering it for free. And people are just loving it back to back. But I'm like, man, so important. we can get this stuff. So now, let me ask you this. Here's, here's been my experience with this, okay? That as I go through, as I learn about this stuff, I, there's different philosophies of when it comes to finances, and nobody's really teaching about this, and it's confusing. Let me let me talk about what I'm talking about. For example, so for example, you got Dave Ramsey, for example, on this side, and he says, "You all you gotta do is just get out of debt, get out of debt, get out of debt, get out of debt." And and when you look at the numbers, so this is one philosophy first. And then you got this other philosophy says, yes, you got to get out of debt, but you got to be saving money at the same time. If you never create this habit, you, you, you can't. So, you know, this is, you see what I'm saying? That's the problem. And then I'll give you another one. So you're going to get an idea. Then I really got under, understood this because I found out, Sharon, I, don't, I found out there's four type of different types of financial. Because we're not teaching this stuff in schools, every information is either coming from their parents or their financial advisor. And then I found out there's four category of financial companies. So the first categories are the big firms like the Chase and Wells Fargo's and the money managers, Merrill Lynch's. So these guys, what they do, they charge 1% on the assets and manage money. Now you have to look at what the quota is. So these guys quota is based on money under management. They charge 1%. So they really talk bad about everything else. Like you say, oh, you should never put money inside insurance or annuities because you don't make, they're like, oh, the annuity guys make commission up front. That's why you shouldn't put money. Then you go, that's their philosophy. And all of these guys are CPA, CFP, 10 acronyms after their names. And they got an, somebody interviewed them from Wall Street Journal and they have an article on it. And there's a bunch of videos. And then on the other hand, you got, the, the, the insurance companies, like, for example, companies like New York Life, Northwestern, Mass Mutual, MetLife, and all these companies, their philosophy is like whole life policy, man. Like, hey, you got infinite banking. This is what you got to do. This is the best philosophy, and you should do annuities, and this is the best way. And then you got, like I said, then you got the Dave Ramsey's and the Primerica guys that they're like, oh, term, only, you guys only do term. And put your money there, invest the difference in a mutual fund. And then you got your independent guys. So it's, and, and depending, if somebody's cousin works at MetLife and they trust that person, they go based on the trust and instead of learning this stuff on their own. And unfortunately, that person who is working at that company, they learn it at that company. And, and that kind of, that philosophy kind of gets passed down to people. Um, I don't know if you've heard that story of the little kid that was uh, trying to, was to ask, his mom was cooking a ham. And he goes to the mom, why are you cutting this side and cutting this side, then putting it in the pan? He says, because my mom did it. They called the mom, like, why did you do it? Like, because my mom did it. They call her, she's like, my pan was too small, so I cut this side and cut this side, then I put it in the pan. So it, it kind of passed out generation. So it's kind of confusing uh, for people. It, 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 so um, I guess the point I'm trying to say, I wanted to see your point of view on this and how financial education is important to learn this stuff instead of like just trusting somebody. Sure, well, first of all and foremost, you, know, you are the CEO of your own life. And so yes, there's all kinds of different advice out there. And that what you've just said validates my, when I talked about you, you know, the rich stay richer, the poor stay poor because we learn from the people around us instead of being educated so that we can level the playing field. And it's so important for people to understand that every wealthy individual in the world has one thing in common. They own income producing assets. And so I like to try and step above all of the fray that you just talked about, because those are pieces of advice that you can listen to. The issue is what are you gonna do for yourself? And this is from the, and I saw actually John had a slide up earlier. This is the cash flow quadrant from the second book I did in Rich Dad. And I want everybody to look at this because on the left side, this is you working for money as an employee or a self-employed person. You're exchanging time for money. There's only seven days in a the week. There's only 24 hours in the day. 
this is where you get tired. Okay, the right side, these are economic engines that you're creating, assets, as a business owner or as an investor. And everything you just talked about is, and everything that I teach is moving people to the right side of the quadrant. Now, as I sit before you, I still make money in all four. I'm an employee of my own corporations. I'm self-employed, I, I get, uh, get paid for speaking, but I have multiple businesses and investors and my husband and I make most of our money on the right side of the quadrant. The amount of money you can make on the left side is finite, but on the right side is infinite. And what you're talking about insurance and life insurance, that's protecting the economic engines yourself and what you've built. And in order to be financially free, it's when the income from your assets exceeds your monthly expenses. So everything John was talking about, now is the time. I mean, we've had a global reset, right? It's like you have, you have a free ticket to redefine and recreate your life. Look at how you're spending your money, figure out what you need to reduce, but also look at where your money's coming from and how can you create new economic engines to start giving you that passive income so that you can get to that point. Many people right now that are watching this, you may have realized that you haven't set aside a big enough emergency fund. So now's the time to say, what can I do in the future to build that emergency fund so that I protect myself and my family? But what you're talking about cash, you know, from an insurance perspective is so vitally important to protect yourself. I mean, today, I just this morning learned from a dear friend, 62, just real, just found out that he's riddled in cancer and has less than a week to live. In the midst of all of this, his wife can't even see him in the hospital because of the virus separation. And you know, it, it's just such a reminder to all of us to live each day and to make sure we're, we're spending our money wisely. And you talk about Dave Ramsey, when it comes to debt, there's good debt and there's bad debt. And I love all the advice John gave, but I would like to add one piece to that because if you are a homeowner and you have a mortgage, now is the time to see if you can refinance and get that lower interest rate. And by doing that, you may actually generate free up enough income to pay off those credit cards. Get rid of those high interest rate credit cards. Get yourself grounded. But now is the time to be looking at refinancing your home mortgage so that you can get a lower fee a lower monthly payment and start putting the additional money into investments, not in the bank, into investments. That's, that's awesome. That's a, that's a great segue on what I wanted to talk about because, uh, so I want to talk about business for a second when you were uh, showing that. And, uh, and, and, and I, I love what you just heard because this is, I really believe there has to be something where people can learn without uh, motives, if that makes sense. So, the person that's teaching it, you got to be like, that's why I love the platform that we have because we can kind of, doesn't matter. We, we have no quotas, you know, kind of like what we did, Sharon, we figured um, we, the way we're kind of revolutionizing the industry is because financial services industry always wanted people to come on board full time. People had to come on full time. They had quotas and to sell certain specific things. What we did, we said, we created a platform where any kind of product can be offered through it, whether it's, retirement, whether it's insurance, whether it's college planning, whether it's trust, whether it's a debt settlement, whether it's whatever it is that has to do with money can be offered through it. Our job would be just educating people on it. So I, I think people should have this. I want to see, get your input on this. I think, I feel people need to understand all of this stuff that you need to have a business. You need to have real estate. You need to have liquid assets. You need to understand all of this stuff, which is what rich dad talks about basically is oh, it's income so producing assets. You got to have all of this stuff. It's so true. Many personal um, financial advisors talk about diversification of assets, but when they talk about that, it's like between stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That's it. When yeah. I talk about diversification of assets, it's between paper assets, businesses, real estate, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And so understanding when, when one goes down, another one doesn't right now, B and C rental real estate properties are holding strong because people always need somewhere to live. Um, and the stock market has been on a major up like and this. down. Yeah. So the, how do you protect yourself being diversified across different asset categories? But you're yeah. right, your platform is wonderful. I love the way it gives people the options to design their life that they, way they want. And 
the ability to help people at no matter where they are in their financial lives. So many advisors won't even touch you if you don't have a million dollars of investable assets. And so your program is wonderful because it helps everyone that's in need. Awesome. So now I want to talk about business because you, you just showed that. And so many people, I don't know exact numbers, but so many people, they think they're business owners, but they're really not. They're self-employed. They're, uh, they're a doctor to open up their own doctor office. They're superstars, right? They're, they're, they're superstars. Superstars. So the idea is, everybody, if you have to be there to make money, you don't have a business. So business, so I want to talk about the business is a system that you build or you buy and you bring other people into it and you teach them how to run it and then you eventually can step away from it and make money. So think about it, uh, McDonald's, for example. You buy a system, you pay a million dollars, you buy the system, you recruit a bunch of teenagers, you teach them how to cook. In two days, you got yourself a cook and eventually you can take off and go to your next venture. So I want to talk about the importance of having business because you know a lot of people, again, they don't understand business and it's, they, they have a problem with building a team. Uh, and I always say, show me somebody who doesn't have a team and I'll show you somebody who doesn't have a business. So, so let's talk about going there, especially today more than ever, the importance of having a business that can generate income for you, whether you're there or you're not there. Uh, especially today. So let's talk about that for a second. Why is that Absolutely. a big deal? A business, a true business over here, is operated by other people's money, time, and resources. You've created systems. My One of my, my second favorite word is systems, leverage, royalties. I love all those words. But <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> to, for a business that's an asset, it's, it's got the systems that run it. It's an economic engine. Remember that word, economic engine. That means you're not the one driving it. It's driving itself. So not only is it successful, it's sustainable, it's scalable, and eventually saleable. But if it depends on you, you can't sell it without you going with it. And so to build that business so that it's an economic engine for you is very important. And in Three Feet from Gold, the first book that I did with Napoleon Hill Foundation, um, I released the personal success equation, which kind of goes along with what you were just saying, because people have their passion and their talent. Now, my passion came from anger that we weren't teaching kids about money, but my talent was I'm a CPA and I have all this publishing experience. And most of us stop there. We think they, we have to do everything on our own. But true success is to the power of association. So P plus T, passion plus talent times A, association. And that's what you do have a mentor. The mentor who got you to where you are today may not be the right mentor to take you to where you deserve to be. Um, who's on your team? Who's on your employee? Do you have people who are strong where you are weak? Business is a team sport. Times A is taking action. How many times do we know what we're supposed to do? We just don't do it few people busted. Yeah, me too. And then plus F and that's faith, having faith in yourself. The su successful businesses do one of two things. They solve a problem or they serve a need. I think we have a few problems and a few needs today. And so having that faith in yourself, when you know that you're actually serving other people or solving a problem, it takes it outside of you. It gives you that motivation to jump out of bed in the morning when you remind yourself that you are doing good for the world. And there's nothing wrong with doing well financially by doing good. Mm. Okay, we so, do live in a world of abundance, not in a world of scarcity. And so that F in most people's case is fear. It holds them back. Mm. And you mentioned Outwitting the Devil. That, that book was hidden away for 73 years. It totally is focused on helping people get over their fear. That book applies so much right now. Yes, it is so absolutely yeah. written for today. On page 61, Napoleon he talks about the interrogation of the devil, and he says, you can believe that I'm talking to the real devil or an imaginary. Will you derive any benefit? But on page 61, he, the devil says, you know, I get into people's brains the fear of criticism, old age, loss of love, poverty, death. And... Then he's asked, well, what's the most powerful? And he says, the most powerful tools I use are fear of death and poverty. So what's happening right now? We are the, in the trifecta of fear. Virus, fear of death, ill health. Economy, people you know, not going to work. The market going crazy. 
And the third one is isolation. We're a social culture and we are now isolated. All three of those fears, what happens? Fear either paralyzes us, which most of us it paralyzes. We wanna get under the covers and turn off the lights. Or we turn that switch and we take that fear through faith. We turn it into motivation to take action and start identifying those opportunities. There are tremendous, when, when this economy comes back, it's, there's tremendous opportunities for those of you that are preparing. And just like John said, you know, a, a, new, a new skill, a new side hustle, you know, and new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now is a time to sharpen your ax. Now is a time to get ready to come out the other side and be on top of the wave, not underneath it. And this, you know, what a great opportunity for people to start creating the life that they deserve. This, is, this was so good. I, I, I wrote this down and what you said about system something that's sustainable, something that's scalable, and something that's sellable. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had a landing you were on. When I came across this financial information, I thought it was great, but I, was, uh, I didn't think it was me. I wanted to start a business. So we had a landing you were on. We we're going to sell the land. So I went around and saw, I went to buy Quiznos, Subway, McDonald's, 7-Eleven, gas stations, Remax. I went to every multi-level marketing company. Um, you name it. I created an app, flipped houses. And, and it wasn't until I met uh, one of my mentors, who was a very successful guy. And he said, Cash, why don't you just do this financial business? I said, look, I love uh, this stuff. I love financial information. This is good. But it's not my passion. I want to build a business. So eventually I could do something where I'm not there and I'm making money. He started laughing at me. And, and he said, he started laughing at me. He said, look, do you think the guy who has 10 McDonald's has a passion about selling hamburgers. And I said, no. He said, okay. So you have to understand it's not about the hamburger, even though it is, but it's really about building a business. Mm -hmm. So that's where I understood, uh, you know, look, there's a difference between the guy who owns a restaurant and he has to always be there and it takes him four, five years to be a chef versus a system that can turn anybody to a chef and you can eventually walk away from it. And that really made a big a difference for me. And that's why I think mentorship comes in because if it wasn't because of that mentor, uh, I, I, I would not be where I am. So I want to ask you this because I can't, this is what I believe is, so let's say, this is an example I give, but I want to get your input on it. I say, look, let's say, um, I, let's say Sharon is a master real estate. She, she understands real estate. She's one of the best successful real estate agents, let's just say in uh, Arizona. Cash, on the other hand, doesn't know how to spell real estate. But uh, let's say the, uh, the CEO of the Irvine company, which is one of the largest uh, real estate companies in the world, he comes and says, Cash, I found out you're, a, you're one of my sons, and I'm going to teach you everything I know. I'm going to give you your conne my connections, my resources, and I'm going to teach you how to build the largest real estate company uh, in America. So I always talk about who do you think is going to become more successful. And the answer is me because I have that mentor. So how important that meant, because you could be in a, in a great business, but if you don't have the right mentors, you can fail. But if you have the right mentor, sometimes even if you have the wrong business, you can win. So I've seen this. I want to get your uh, input on that. Well, I heard a, a, a quote last week that I thought was brilliant. It said, um, you know, a smart person will learn from their mistakes. Okay. A genius will learn from the mistakes of others. All right. And it's the same thing as what, that's what a mentor does. A mentor opens a Rolodex. They're coming to the table with a lot of experience. They can help you steer around the pitfalls and speed your way to success. And people still, because of school, teaching us that you have to do things on your own on that left side of the cash flow quadrant, we still, we're afraid to ask for help. And so I tell people, instead of thinking that you're asking for help, see it as an expression of respect. You're respecting that person's wisdom, experience, and counsel, and asking them to be your mentor. And, but be careful who you ask, because a lot of people are willing to give you advice, but you shouldn't take it from them. A lot of people, free advice is free, wisdom is priceless. Business. And you want mentors who bring wisdom to the table that can help you chart the course to the success that you deserve. 
that, that is so true. I always say, look at somebody who's been doing something for 10 years and look at their life and see where their life is at. I remember when I was struggling uh, financially and, and um, actually it was the book, Think and Go Rich. I remember reading Think and Go Rich when he talks about um, the sh burning your ships. I kind of burned my ship too early and, uh, and uh, I was struggling in it. And uh, somebody asked me, why don't you just go back and be an engineer? Because I said, look, every engineer that I know that being an engineer for 10, 20 years, they just have an average life. But then all my mentors, they have a significant, amazing life. They have great relationship. They make great money. They have fun. They have great friendship. So I think that was, uh, that was a big deal because, again, that was the, the, one of my mentors said, told that well, to and me. And it's so important, Cash, right now because, because everybody's online, it's so important to do your due diligence and to make sure you pay attention to who you're asking advice from and to make sure that they actually walk the talk. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of false prophets out there. And um, it, just, it just breaks my heart when I see somebody investing thousands of dollars with someone who I know is not somebody that walks the talk. So please do your due diligence and make sure that they have the success they say they have. Make sure that they are, um, have satisfied clients and I know, you know, John, you and I have talked about this before. It's so important yeah. to pay attention to who you listen to. This is, um, this is so crazy. You know, we're, uh, uh, we're doing these classes. We're doing these financial classes right now. We're doing it for free. So I have these other people that I know, and, and they're like, hey, why do you guys do this stuff for free? You should charge 1000 5000 bucks a pop for every person that's coming in. And we have like close to 1000 people that are coming into these classes. And, um, and it just, it's so interesting how so many people, they're just, they're, they're basically all about that making money from, that's how the, that's the way that they're making money versus we have a bigger goal. We want to really, uh, create, we want, we, we make our money. There's no problem with that, but we want to give a lot of value to people and then connect them to the right people. And then we make our money that way on the back end. but we want to give that education because we're a big believer of that education and cannot wait to get that into our schooling system, Sharon. So, so thank you so much for doing that. Thank you so much for spending your uh, Saturday afternoon here with us. It was just so good. Like I, I, I wrote, to, as I'm talking to you, I wrote so many notes right here, sustainable, scalable, sellable, all these quotes uh, that you give us. It was just so wonderful. And so grateful. I know that uh, one of your purposes is to always add value to other people. I know your dad told you that. To oh, you remember sure, that, huh? Make yeah, sure every day. Every you're... night he'd ask me if you added value to someone's life today. He's been yeah. gone 14 years, but I still ask myself that every night. And I do want to just implore everyone, really evaluate your own personal success equation. Make that decision on your own. Um, I have a download you can get at personalsuccessequation.com. It's not a sales thing. It's just um, an opportunity for you to really evaluate your associations, those that may need to be strengthened or go away, maybe some new ones that you can have and the actions that you need to take, but also build that confidence in yourself and make sure you, if you have the right people around you, they're there to boost you up when you need a little extra support. Like what you're doing today with John and Cash, they're here to support you. They're giving of themselves and bringing this program to you to support you making the right decisions to move yourself forward. That's so awesome. I just wanted you to know that you definitely added a lot of value to a lot of people. I know even as I was talking to you, I was kind of getting emotional over a couple of things when you're talking about getting this stuff into the school because that I have a big passion for that. And, and I know that a lot of people feel the same way on here on this call. So you definitely did that. So we are, we're seriously grateful. I know I'm grateful. I know John is from the bottom of our heart uh, for you to, to spend this time with everybody. Well, so it's my so honor. Much. It's my honor. Now is the time to position yourself for great growth and design the life you want. Absolutely. Best time to start a business, everybody. So uh, I'm going to ask John for any closing uh, thoughts, but I want to make sure that you guys get back together with the person who basically invited you. Ask them about the classes we do about money and, and how you can get your finances together. We do this free financial analysis for people. Uh, it's kind of like a financial x-ray. Uh, we show you how to put that stuff together. You learn a lot about money. We show you how to build your own business. We have a system. You can scale it. So to get back to the person who invited you, but I wanted to, uh, to see John, if you wanted to say any closing thoughts on this. 
No, I, I, um, I mean, I just loved everything that Sharon shared with everybody. And, you know, the most important thing is for people to take action right now, right? Don't, don't let a pandemic or a virus paralyze you where you're, some of you are curled up in a fetal position, laying on your couch, acting as, as if this is doomsday and it's not doomsday. Uh, this is an opportunity, everybody. Jump on the bandwagon and uh, take a uh, hold of your future. Um, you know, I just want you guys to know next Tuesday, um, I wanted to share this with everyone here real fast. You know, people always ask who influences or who mentors the mentors. And, uh, you know, I, as I've told many of you, I can count them on one hand how many people have mentored me and got into my mind. Uh, you know, obviously one of them is my father and, and my mother and and I've got three others. And uh, last week, you guys met with one of them. You heard from him. His name is Rich Dolly. This coming Tuesday is uh, this man right here. His name is Monty Holm. And um, just what an amazing man he is. And he'll be on at 730. We'll be going for uh, about an hour from 730 to 830. And we encourage all of you to dial in. And again, it's very, very important that you guys uh, register on this site as you're looking at this, my, my uh my cursor, a lot of you texted me this morning, Instagram, DM, Facebook, emailed my staff. How do I get on? How do I get on with, uh, with Sharon Lecter this afternoon? Well, you had to have registered. So make sure you register on this site. Uh, again, we have this up here. Take a screenshot of it next week on Tuesday at 730. Sharon, thank you so much for jumping on uh, with us today and sharing your, your amazing wisdom. And appreciate all that you still do. And you're still out there every day. I see all your webinars every day that you're promoting. And those of you, follow Sharon on Instagram and, uh, and, and just, you know, get on there. She's also got um, her own podcast show that you guys can tune on. She brings on amazing guests uh, on her show. And, again, like right now, this is, this is not a time for you guys to go and sit there and watch the news rather than watching TV and all that, you know, the, 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 the virus, as one of my uh, mentors said last week, there's the, the coronavirus and there's the media virus. Uh, instead of watching the virus, I really encourage all of you guys to, um, again, you don't have to be a woman to read Thinking Grow Rich for Women. That is, uh, you, you, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. You, you need to read that book. Uh, Outwitting the Devil, get the book, or, you know, I'd love to hear it on audio. Uh, yeah, that is an awesome book. Um, I mean, it really is. I mean, I know I spoke with, uh, uh, you know, Cash about this and everyone else. It's one of the best books I've ever read. So we encourage you to read that. And, of course, my book as well, down here on the corner, you'll see How Rich Asians Think. It is officially up on Amazon uh, as an audio, and you can listen to the audio as well. So, awesome. and Cash, we need, we need, Cash, you need to become an author yourself, brother. You need to get a book out, buddy. <laughs> You know, you keep telling me that. So awesome, everybody. Make sure you're following Sharon. So as you can see, uh, her name, S-H-A-R-O-N, Lecter, on Instagram, and uh, John Shin and myself, K-A-S-H-R-E-S-T-A-N. We have a lot of events that are coming up, and you guys will know about all the events over there. So all right, everybody, thank you so much, and have a blessed Saturday afternoon.